Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, Thursday before spring recess. Thanks for some of you for showing up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the schedule. Obviously, we were not here on Tuesday. It was town hall meeting day, but I did put up a link for the undergraduates to uh, assignment eight, uh, which is due uh, this coming Monday. And I just wanted to talk about assignment eight a little bit because it is uh, a bit of a departure from the evolutionary algorithms that you've been implementing in six and seven. Uh, it tends to be a fair bit more work than some of the other deliverables, so do make sure uh, of the other assignments. So give it a little bit of time for preparation. What you're gonna be doing in assignment eight is swapping out this very, very simple scissor bot that you've been working with so far. As you probably figured out, the scissor bot was designed to be as simple as possible, the fewest parts and joints and motors and sensors and so on that would get at least some forward locomotion. And you're gonna be replacing the scissor bot with the quadruped uh, today uh, in assignment eight. The quadruped, like you did for, uh, like you did for, like you did for uh, the scissor bot, I suggest you create an engineering drawing. If you feel more comfortable doing this on pen and paper, that's perfectly fine. If you feel more comfortable doing this electronically, that's fine as well. You're creating obviously a quadruped with four legs that is radially symmetric, meaning it is symmetric all the way about uh, radially. Uh, made up of nine objects, eight joints, a number of sensors and motors, which results, as you can imagine, is in a slightly more complex uh, neural network. It is particularly important as you start to build up the quadruped that you add one object at a time, compile, run, and check that the object is where you expect it to be. Uh, obviously, all the objects here are color-coded, so you know which object is which. Add one joint at a time to make sure it's the joint that's connecting the pairs of objects you think and that the objects are rotating relative to one another about the fulcrum so that you can you know where the fulcrum is and so on and so forth. So make sure to implement assignment eight breadth first rather than depth first. Any questions about the assignments? Final projects, weekly deliverables? Yeah. De is it dead weight? Good question. For those of you that have worked with the quadruped, what is the main body doing, either than holding all the four legs together? Depending on the gait that evolves, the weight itself can be useful for behavior. Remember back at the beginning of the course, we were looking at the brachiating robot that's swinging from arm to arm. It has the dead weight of the batteries, but it actually exploits that. The idea of embodied cognition is that evolution can figure out ways to exploit the body. So depending on the gate, it may be dead weight or it might actually be exploitable. Depending on your final project, it is also a good platform for putting arms and grippers and rotational turrets, throwing arms, whatever else you're gonna do in, in, uh, in your final project. Any other questions about the assignments? No? Okay, so back to uh, lecture. Um, so we are now going to dive into a one, two, three, four, five, six lecture series on arguably the biggest outstanding problem in evolutionary robotics and arguably robotics in general, which is crossing the reality gap. You've all probably seen evolved behaviors in your scissor bot or in the quadruped that you are pretty sure is never going to transfer to reality. Some of those gates and behaviors are obvious that they're not gonna transfer. Some might look realistic in simulation, but unbeknownst to you, evolution has found a way to exploit the interaction of the simulated body with the physics engine that again is not gonna transfer to reality. So if we evolve interesting or potentially useful behaviors in simulation, how do we know a priori before we cross the reality gap that they will work uh, in reality? It's an uh, open problem. And we're going to do this series of lectures in chronological order. We're gonna start with the radical envelope of noise hypothesis, which was the, arguably the first attempt to cross the sim to real gap in evolutionary robotics back in the early 90s all the way up to the 3D printing of 1D robots, which is a paper published last year or the year before. So we're gonna cover a fair bit of ground in this, sex, uh, in this six lecture series. 
Uh, lecture 15 is pretty short. We'll probably finish that today and move on to lecture uh, 16. And then we've got a little bit of breathing room for spring recess. Uh, I will be traveling to a conference in Uruguay the week after spring break, so I will not be here. Uh, Josh Powers will be joining you again to uh, walk you through the Resilient Machines Project. Uh, the Tuesday after spring recess, and then also the transferability project the following Thursday. And then I will see you all again on March the 24th. I will be in email contact throughout that time, as will the TA. So on we go. Any questions about where we are, where we're going? Question. Yeah, just to be clear, the next assignment is due like the Monday of spring break. The, it is due the Monday of spring okay. break. I suggest you finish it early so you have some time off, but it's up to you. Yes. And then the next one is due the Monday. Uh, when we're back, absolutely. Yes, you get a break from lectures, but not a break from the assignments. Okay. Yes. Uh, the week we are not here, when we have a guest lecture, there will be no quiz. So there will be no quiz for lecture 17 or 18. I'll post something about that on Blackboard. Any other questions? No? Okay, so crossing the reality gap, before we go all the way back to the early 90s, let's actually start uh, in the present day, or at least 2018. Uh, there was a research paper published by the NVIDIA Corporation, who uh, is famous for creating some of the first graphics processing units, or GPUs, uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, which are now relatively commonplace. They are primarily a hardware company, a GPU company, but like every tech company on the planet, they are also diversifying their portfolio into AI. And this is NVIDIA's uh, contribution to AI. Back in 2018, NVIDIA Corporation published this paper and said, wouldn't it be great if we trained our robots in simulation using, of course, GPU accelerated physics engines and then transferred those solutions to reality? Many of us who worked in evolutionary robotics thought we had heard this before. So this is a, an old idea that's being rediscovered by modern companies now. Um, if you have GPUs, obviously you can simulate not just one complex robot, but many robots in parallel. What can you tell me about the different robots and the different tasks they're performing here? What is the task? Say that again. Different orientations of the robot, right? So if you squint carefully, you'll notice the poses are not quite the same. What, is the what are the robots trying to do? What is the task here? Peg into the hole. Peg in, this is the peg into the hole task, yeah. Without me telling you about the details of this experiment, what details of the experiment can you guess at from the picture? This, they're not all the same peg and hole, they're different sizes? They're not all the same, right? So this was an attempt to uh, cross the sim to real gap by making sure that any one simulated robot did not experience exactly the same environment twice, right? Again, we've heard this before, Heraclitus, man never enters the same river twice. The NVIDIA robot here never plays the same peg and hole game twice, right? Kind of an intuitive idea, and as promised, this is an idea that goes back to, I'm sorry, actually 1997. Um, and way back then, uh, there were no physics engines, but there were sort of models, virtual models of robots and so on, which we'll see in a moment. But before we get there, there was already the understanding that evolution will create controllers that exploit details of the simulation or the model, sort of pre-physics engines. However, if some details of that model or that simulation do not exist in reality, if evolution is exploiting them and we take away those details when we move to reality, obviously the evolved solution is going to fail. So there was a realization very early about this deep problem of how to cross this gap. The hypothesis, which again occurs to many people uh, since then, adding noise to the simulator might help because evolution is not able to latch on to any specific detail which may be wrong in reality, and that detail is constant from one simulation or one evaluation to the next. But I've underlined here adding noise in the right way. So this is still an open problem because obviously it makes sense to add noise, but where? Where in the simulation should we add the noise? In the case of the NVIDIA project, they added noise to 
uh, the blocks and the pegs and so on. But you'll notice that the robot's body itself is constant. So there's an assumption here that changing the robot's environment or noisifying the robot's environment is a good thing, but no need to do so with uh, the body. That may or may not be a good assumption to make, given the robot and the task and the simulation and the training algorithm and so on. So, okay. So the, obviously this raises the question of which aspects of the simulation are we going to noisify? And the more complex the simulation becomes, there are more things that could be noisified. If we noisify too much, there's nothing for evolution to exploit, right? It's too difficult a task. If one river to the next is too difficult, you can't step into it because you have no idea what's going to happen. Too little noise, and evolution is going to exploit details in the simulation that don't exist in reality. So although this idea may be intuitive, it's hard to get right uh, in practice. So uh, in this particular first experiment here, they tried to create a minimal simulation, right? We've seen this idea before when we looked at the minimal cognition experiments. Let's try and keep things as simple as possible. Simple is different from noisifying complex details. Okay, so we're going to see this minimal si simulation in a moment. We're going to remove as many details uh, as possible. Here's just an example from some of my work that Josh Powers will walk you through uh, the week after spring recess. Uh, we had a physics engine back in 2006. We evolved gates for the quadruped you're implementing in assignment eight here. Here's snapshots from a video, and you'll see the video in two weeks' time. Um, snapshots of the gait of this robot, and you'll notice that it is not a quadrupedal gait. This robot does not stand up and walk. If you can sort of mentally run the video from looking at these frames, what is the robot doing? There was a question earlier about is the main body dead weight? The main body is definitely not dead weight in this particular evolved gait. It's using the body as a foot. It actually never stands up off the ground. Why not? We use the standard fitness function here, which was forward displacement. The fitness function didn't say anything about stand up and then forwardly displace. Uh, it could be. So, so definitely there were probably differences in the mass distributions in the simulated robot compared to the physical one, which you can see. And that might have biased it towards keeping the body on the ground. Remember our discussion about lo locomotion and legged locomotion in particular? Exactly, right? Remember that all legged locomotion and leg motion, leg, uh, locomotion in general is trying to strike a trade off between four competing objectives move quickly, move efficiently, move stably, and what are we missing? Move generally, right? Move across as many different environments as possible. If evolution hits on this particular strategy, which is moving where, where it's keeping the body more or less on the ground for part of the gait cycle, it's relatively stable, and small mutations to the controller produce changes in that gait but don't cause the robot to fall over because it can't fall over, right? Evolution has switched onto this track where it's favoring stability, which as we know from our discussion about locomotion comes at a cost which is probably speed, and also efficiency. This robot is not very inefficient in its motion, which you'll really see when you see the video. A anyways, the point here is we evolved in a simulation. You can see visually lots of differences between the simulated robot and the physical robot. In this case, we actually got particularly lucky when we transferred this evolved controller to reality. The physical robot, it, we crossed the gap more or less the physical robot did what the simulated robot did. Part of the reason, a main reason why we probably got lucky is we, was because of this stability issue, right? Even if the mass distribution is slightly different on the physical robot compared to the simulated robot, maybe it doesn't matter too much if you're keeping most of your mass on the ground and performing more or less peristaltic locomotion, this inchworm form of locomotion. The robot also sort of throws its, its weight forward 
So one student said this was a cross between peristaltic motion and the, the breakdance worm move, you know. It's a very strange gait, but at least it works. Even more surprisingly is we didn't cross the gap perfectly. This is, this is a snapshot uh, over, I think, two or three gait cycles. But you'll notice that at particular points, there are differences. But those differences disappear again towards the latter part of the cycle. At one point in the gait cycle, the robot lifts itself up on its left and right legs, and then lifts up its front and back legs and sort of throws itself forward. The mass distribution is definitely different between the simulated and physical robot. So the point at which it rocks forward or backwards is different, but that slight detail is papered over by the gait itself, which is relatively stable. If this was a robot that stood up and walked, uh, in which at any point in the gait cycle, there may be three or four of the legs in contact with the ground, or two out of the four legs in contact with the ground, or just one in contact with the ground, you could imagine that any slight difference between the simulation, simulated and real robot, that difference might be more catastrophic for that particular gait. So, sim to real it gets complicated quickly because it depends on the robot, the task, the particular gait, uh, the environment, the training algorithm, and so on. Okay, back to the, this, early, uh, this early attempt to cross the gap. The investigators in this case uh, attacked the problem of which aspects of the simulation to noisify by identifying two different, two different classes of phenomena in the simulator. Well, the first class was what they called the base set. So these were certain things that, although they might not be a perfect representation of reality, they have a correspondence in reality. So uh, the robot here is traveling over flat ground. There is also some ground in reality. The ground in reality is definitely not going to be perfectly flat. It may be carpet. It may be linoleum. Going to be slight differences. Then there are also implementation details things that exist in the simulator that have no basis in reality. Given your experience with the physics engine Pyrosim, or actually Open Dynamics Engine, which is the physics engine that is sitting underneath Pyrosim, what are some details there that have no correspondence in reality? Is kind of? Flying. Okay, so the, the motor strength in the quadruped is definitely different from reality. But there are motors that have greater strength, and the motors have a correspondence in reality. That would probably go into the base set. It's, it's a bit of a false distinction here. They're making a distinction between things that are more or less realistic in the simulator, where, of course, it's really going to be a gradient in reality. What are some of the things that are particularly unrealistic in Pyrosim? Yeah, they, can overlap each other. they can overlap one another, right? That is, unless you're dealing with soft objects in reality, interpenetration, that particular interaction, it has no correspondence in reality, right? Physical objects cannot interpenetrate one another, right? Assuming they're rigid, dense objects. Okay. Exactly, right? So the scissor bot is perfectly balanced, right? So perfect uh, bilateral symmetry, perfect symmetry, that definitely does not exist in, in reality. None of the motors or anything in power sim need power sources or anything? Ah, there's no right, exactly. So infinite power or uh, the battery is infinitely small if you want, right? And infinitely dense. That would probably today go in the implementation set of, of interactions, right? So again, this is a bit of an arbitrary game where you draw the line, but you, you sort of get the, the idea here. Okay, so let's look at the simulated robot and the minimal simulator they used here. This should look very familiar to you by now. Um, they're going to eventually try and cross the gap into the physical Kepera robot, the hockey puck robot, which we're looking at from above, left and right wheel. In this case, they had uh, eight infrared sensors. Remember, infrared sensors send out an infrared beam and measure the amount of time it takes for that beam to come back. So they're measuring distance 
somehow, right, indirectly. We also have two ambient light sensors, one on the left and one on, on the right, and that's about it. So we've got 10 sensors, two motors, pretty familiar. The task we haven't seen before, but this is very familiar if you've ever taken a psychology class. Usually this is done with rats. Today we're going to do this with uh, robots. This is the tea maze task. We're going to place the robot in the stem of the tea, and its evolved controller is going to take over, and the robot is going to do its thing. And if it ever gets to this point in the stem of the tea, there will be a light that will be flashed from either the right or the left. And once the robot passes by the light, the light is turned off, and the robot has to remember which side it saw the light on. And when it gets to the junction, it has to turn in that direction and go up that, uh, that side of the T, right? Pretty straightforward. Why is this such a famous task in psychology? What is this task meant to measure in organisms, or in our case, robots? Memory, right? It's impossible to solve this task without memory, right? Is it? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Decades, if not a century of work, has been done with the tea maze to test whether organisms have memory or not. Can you solve this task without requiring memory? Remember, the light is turned off right after it disappears. Probabilistically, there's two people to go. That's true. That's true. You could get lucky. Let's say, let's say we evolve a robot to do this, and it does, we, we do it 100 times, and it does much, much better than chance. It turns in the correct direction much more than 50%. Do we conclude from that the robot has evolved the ability to remember on what side the light was flashed? Not notice that it goes off. It's going to have to, it, it's not going to be able to see the light when it gets to the junction, right? Perhaps the robot is like on a delay sensor, so it sees the light and it turns, but it's delayed. It sees the light and it's delayed, possibly. Uh, yeah, that could be. When it sees the light, it turns 10 degrees and then drives straight. That might work. Same. As soon as it the light. Moment it sees the light, it start. It, it triggers some arc that that sends it down the right path. That's another p potential solution. Is the right path always in the same direction? The right. Yeah. The correct path. The the correct the direction it should turn is always the side at which it saw the light. So you just develop a bias towards one direction and always remember to stop at lights, but the bias would match with the direction. Uh, there, there's no bias between the the flash on the left and right. There's a fifty percent chance that the light's going to come on on the left or the right. It's got to remember that then, right? At the time. At the time, it's going to set something, set some internal state, but that's still memory, right? If it's setting something internally, and then it's retaining that internal state after the light goes off, that, for our purposes, that is memory. You might be able to see the light, and for example, if it has to turn right, start turning left, and then bounce off of the wall, and then see the wall, and not have to go right. There's an infinite number of strategies of things it could do at the time that the light is flashed where it no longer needs to retain any internal state. It influences the sensor motor coordination that causes it to, to end up in the right top of the, the T. The other simplest thing to do is when you see the light, just turn a little bit towards the wall that you saw the light and then just follow that wall. You don't need to remember why you're following that particular wall and just have a heuristic that Whenever you get to a junction, you turn towards the side at which the wall is closest. Right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Now, whether rats actually do this and whether that has misled psychologists or biologists in concluding that certain organisms have memory when they don't, who knows, but just yet another example that thinking about thinking is misleading. Luckily for our discussion today and for this paper, it doesn't matter whether the robot solves this task with memory or not. We want to see whether we can evolve robots in simulation to solve the T-maze. And then when we put physical robots in a physical T-maze with these evolved controllers, 
it still solves the task. Yeah? Okay, you could probably imagine for yourself fitness functions that would work. Uh, in this case, they have uh, a conditional fitness function. Uh, if the robot gets to the top of the T and turns in the, the correct direction, it gets 100 points plus however far up the stem it traveled, D1, and how far along the correct top branch of the T it traveled, D2. Uh, if the robot travels up the stem, regardless of whether it turned in the correct direction or, or not, or whether it even got to the top of the T, it gets D1 units of distance plus D2. So even if it's able to turn and go down one of the top branches, even if it's the wrong branch, it gets some points for that. So we're re rewarding for robots that travel up the T, turn at the top of the T, and travel along one of the stems plus additional points if it turns in the right way, right? Pretty straightforward. That's the task. Question? Is, is the way it was reasoned that it is still rewarding the robot to, to turn is to make sure that the robot does not just go up and stops? Exactly. It goes up and stops or goes up and turns around and goes back down or turns in a circle. It's D2 is rewarding for when you get to the junction, turn 90 degrees and go straight or go as far along the branch as possible. Okay, here's the minimal simulation of this task environment, which is clearly not a T. The robot is placed into phase one of the simulation, which is an infinitely long corridor. And as it travels along this infinitely long corridor, there is the light zone. So there is a light that will flash on either side. And if it travels sufficiently far, the robot is magically transported into this second infinitely long corridor in phase two. And whatever it does in this second infinitely long corridor, however far it travels in that corridor, that's D2. In this second, in this second uh, infinitely long corridor, you can see that if the moment the robot is, is teleported into this corridor, it's facing one of the walls, and behind it is this noise zone. So what's the noise zone? Remember that the robot has infrared sensors, most on the front and two on the back. Any simulated infrared beam that hits the noise zone returns a completely random number to that sensor. It's like complete fog. Whatever is in there, the robot can't see. Whenever it probes that zone, it always gets a completely different number. Why would someone in their right minds create such a simulation? What are the implementation details here? The ones that are almost impossible to simulate, and so they've put 100% noise on it. And what are some of the details that are more are probably going to be more or less true when we transfer this robot into the physical T maze? For the engineers that are here that have actually worked with infrared sensors, they have an Achilles heel, they have a fatal flaw. They don't work very well. Remember that they rely on reflection. So an infrared sensor will send out a beam, and if that beam hits a surface that is more or less uh, orthogonal to the beam, the beam is coming back. If I hit something that is oblique to the beam, the beam shoots off and I never hear back from the beam. From my point of view, that object is infinitely far away. But obviously, if I get closer to it, the oblique angle becomes less, it becomes more orthogonal, and I will now see it if I have infrared sensors. What happens if there was foam covering the wall and I shot my infrared beam into the foam? It would be absorbed, or perhaps it's got a very uh, irregular geometry. Who knows what's going to happen? Simulating infrared beams that are shooting around, even in something that, to us, from the distal perspective, outside the robot's point of view, seems relatively simple, like a T-junction. From the robot's point of view, or from the point of view of these eight infrared beams, there's some complex geometries that are going on at this junction. So you can be pretty sure that simulating uh, infrared, uh, infrared light behavior within this region is either gonna be very, very difficult, 
And even if you get it more or less right, it's probably not going to transfer well to actual T maze junctions in reality. So in this case, they classified this region as an implementation detail, and they got rid of it altogether. Which again, kind of seems anti-intuitive. How can you train a robot in this environment and put it in a physical maze and it will do the right thing? Okay. Okay, so I mentioned this is a minimal simulation. We saw one simplification, which is no T maze, but just two junctions. It's so simple that there is no physics engine, there is no virtual uh, environment, there's no virtual model. They're just lookup tables. So there are two lookup tables, and table number one, whatever, uh, table number one, um, they, they look up the robot's current orientation. And, uh, and basically the values that are being sent to the two motors and the lookup table says for that orientation and for these, this difference in motor commands, this is the new X and Y position of the robot, right? A short time later. So you can imagine this big lookup table, there's a whole bunch of orientations and a whole bunch of differences between left and, mo left and right motor signals. You do a little bit of trigonometry and you figure out where the robot would be at the next time step. Table number two, which is they take, they look up the robot's current orientation theta relative to the closest wall and the distance from the wall. And they try and guess more or less what the infrared value, what the value of the infrared sensor would be in that case. So for a theta of zero facing more or less head on to the wall and a small dy very close to the wall, as you can imagine, you're going to get a very large value on your infrared sensor because it takes a very short period of time for the beam to go out and come back. Theta of zero, but far from the wall, you're going to get maybe an intermediate value. Far from the wall and facing somewhat obliquely, maybe you get a little bit uh, of the returning beam. So you get uh, a value that's near zero, but not quite zero. A theta of 90, so the wall is off here. I shoot my infrared beam this way. The infrared sensor reports a value of zero. Right? So for a whole bunch of thetas and dy's, what is the likely value of the infrared sensor for each of the eight sensors. Make sense? They're not simulating infrared beams. They're not simulating turning wheels. There's no inertia, momentum, no masses, no joints, no nothing. Just look up tables. Changes in positions and changes in sensor values. But that means simulation. The robot does not have infrared sensors installed on it. They're just calculating values of yeah, there is no robot in the simulation to begin with, right? There's no robot, there's no simulation, there's no nothing, there are only lookup tables. That's it. So how does this work? Let's see, I think I have a picture of the, here we go, a picture of the neural network here. Here is a sample evolved neural network. We take this neural network and quote unquote put it in the simulator at a particular position. We put the robot at a particular position, an X and Y position in the first corridor. We calculate the theta and the dy and the x and y. We look at the two values arriving at the motor sensor, at the motor neurons. We compute the new x and y position of the robot. We compute the new values of the infrared sensors according to the second lookup table, and away we go. Yeah? So the, there is really no embodiment here, but the robot still can push against the environment and observe how the environment pushes back. It's just that the environment are two lookup tables. Hard to think of a more minimal simulation than this, right? Okay. Where did we get to? Okay. So uh, here's the base set. So here are some, some various phenomena that are more or less one-to-one -one between simulation and reality, which is how the robot moves in response to the motor signals. So if both left and right uh, motors are sending out high values, the robot is moving forward. X and Y is going to be very different at the next time step kind of how the infrared sensors respond. They put a little bit of effort into getting this right and how the ambient sensors respond. So if the robot's X and Y position is here uh, and it's facing down the corridor, the right ambient sensor, the right ambient light sensor is gonna receive a larger value than the left 
ambient light sensor. Okay. They added a little bit of noise to these details because they know that they're getting these details wrong. They're just in a lookup table. They're not going to be perfect, a perfect ref, uh, replication of reality. But how the infrared sensors are going to behave at the T-junction, that they put 100% noise in. So if the robot's X and Y position is close to the noise zone in the second corridor and any of those infrared sensors are facing the noise zone, those sensors are getting back completely random values at every time step, which is kind of a strange thing, right? The robot is receiving random numbers in one or more of its input neurons and evolution has to deal with that somehow. Okay. They also added some noise to some of the other things, which as the T-maze requires, the light can come from either the left or the right side whenever the robot gets to that point. They varied the width of the corridor itself, the starting orientation of the robot when they placed it in the, the corridor, the length of the light zone, and the corridor length itself. So the stem of the T, how long or short that was. As you can probably guess from all this lead up, they actually succeeded in crossing the gap in this case. And the physical robot using one of the evolved controllers from simulation does well. And it's relatively robust. As you would imagine, it's robust to corridor width and starting orientation. What are some of the things that such a, ro a physical robot may not be robust to? What changes could we make to the physical T maze that are not spanned by this set of noisified details. Yep. Change the, maze style. the maze style, right? So if instead of a T, if we had a Y, right? The, the angle of the junction, maybe, who knows, right? We could try, but it seems unlikely. Yep. Maybe if the ground was on level. Absolutely, right? So it's assumed there is no virtual ground here, but the nature of the, the lookup table, we're doing trigonometry in two dimensions, not three dimensions. So it's probably not going to be very robust to bumps in the ground. You can imagine there's probably an infinite number of other variations in reality it's not going to be robust to. Okay. Uh, as we've seen before, they were evolving just the controllers in this case. Yeah, question. I just have one question. Sure. Yes. Yep. That means that the other areas don't have any light. A complete darkness. Exactly. Which again is maybe not a very realistic situation. If you ever played with physical robots, one of the things that is the hardest is uh, ambient light, right? For Lego robots and some of the other robot kits you can play with, best thing is to turn off all the lights in the room and shut the blinds, right? Okay. To us, it looks like the light in this room is constant, but thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay. So they evolved the controllers. They evolved the weights of the controllers in this case, and they also evolved the activation functions, which we've now seen once before when we were talking about CPPNs. We saw that last week. In that case, they were evolving the shape of the function itself. Some neurons had a sigmoid function, some had the identity function, some had a trigonometric function. In this case, they had a step function. So for this neuron here, which has a threshold of 0.71 associated with it, if the incoming, if the weighted sum arriving at this neuron was negative, the neuron was set to minus one. Or sorry, if the, I'm sorry, if the weighted sum was below 0.71, they would set the value of that neuron to minus one. If the, weighted, the value of the weighted sum arriving at this neuron was above 0.71, they'd set that neuron to a value of plus one. You'll notice that the other neurons in this case have different uh, thresholds. Right? So as we'll see as we continue, we can put different subsets of the robot's body and brain under evolutionary control. Also, like we've seen before, they also built in some details themselves that they believe are generally useful, like perfect bilateral symmetry. Okay. And you'll notice uh, there are also some recurrent connections here. So if the robot does need to remember or evolution starts to hit on a solution that relies on memory, it's possible. Some of these connections are excitatory and some are inhibitory. 
I wanted just uh, the reason I wanted to touch on this detail is you'll notice there's an interesting neural circuit here between the left light sensor and the right light sensor, which is an inhibitory connection going from left to right and another inhibitory connection going from right to left. This is an idea that, we, that is seen in a lot of uh, biological brains, which is mutual inhibition. We have two neurons or two neural circuits that are mutually inhibiting one another. Why is that useful in this task? Usually, neuro, usually evolved neural networks are very hard to parse, but this particular detail actually makes intuitive sense if you think about it. Absolutely, right? So we flash, imagine the light flashes from the left, so the light sensor lights up a little bit, but maybe the right sensor lights up a little bit as well, especially in reality, because we don't have localized, localized light. So there might be a slight difference between the light, the left and the right light sensor, and if there's noise, if there's flicker or obliqueness or the turning of the wheel covers up the light and then allows the light to go again, there may be some complicated details and it may be hard for the robot to see and especially remember on which side the light came. If there is a slight asymmetry to begin with, slightly more light on the left, that means there is slightly more inhibition of the left on the right and slightly less inhibition from the right on the left. What happens at the next time step in this example? Left is inhibiting right slightly more than right is inhibiting left. What can you tell me about the pair of values in those neurons at the next time step? So what does inhibition mean here, right? Inhibition usually means the weight of the synapse is negative. And if we say more inhibition, this, this weight is more negative than the other weight. What's happening? It's trying to see where the light is more intensified. Okay, maybe. So we're going, to, we're going to avoid anthropomorphization for a moment, that the network is trying to do this or the robot is trying to do this. We're just thinking about the neural mechanics here. We have two neuron values. One value is slightly larger than the other. The left value is slightly larger than the right. And there is a slightly more negative weight going from the left neuron to the right neuron and a slightly less, less negative weight going from the right neuron to the left neuron. What happens at the next time step? Exactly, right? There is more inhibition of the right, so the value of the right neuron goes down more at the next time step. And the left neuron value also is going down, but by less at the next time step. So the difference between those values has just been magnified. Now, if the light continues to flash for a few time steps, they're also increasing because they're receiving light. But basically what mutual inhibition does is it magnifies slight differences between things, right? You're squinting at something in almost complete darkness and it's a little hard to resolve it. You can think of lots of examples in adaptive behavior where you're trying to distinguish between slight differences. Your brain helps with that by sharpening differences using mutually, inhibi mutually inhibitory uh, circuits. We talked about central pattern generators before, which, it, which output this sinusoidal pattern. And up till now, we've been talking about CPGs, central pattern generators, as black boxes. They just output a sinusoidal signal. You could probably now sit down with pen and paper and write uh, create a two-neuron, two-synapse, mutually inhib inhibitory signal where they actually start to oscillate. As one goes up, it more inhibits the other one, and the other one is going down, so it less inhibits. You can actually get into a situation where they start to oscillate by setting these weights carefully. You can play around with that and try that, try that out. Okay, so where's the memory of the light? There is memory here in the mutually inhibitory signal. Even when the light goes away, these two light sensors now, because of the mutually inhibitory 
uh, circuit have pushed each other to their extremes, have maximized their difference, and they can hold it as the robot goes forward. But as we talked about a few minutes ago, that's not strictly necessary. Okay, all this build up for this picture. Um, they took the best evolved. They took the best evolved circuit from uh, simulation or from the lookup tables and transferred it into reality. They put the uh, the robot down here. It started to drive forward. They flashed uh, the the light on the left. A couple of times, if you look carefully, you'll notice there's a couple of traces here. And every time the robot did the right thing, every time they put the flashlight on the robot's right, it also always did the right thing. They took the robot and put it in a wider corridor that the robot had never seen before, still did the right thing. What, what did they differ in the bottom pair of images? Starting orientation, right? So the robot wasn't facing straight up the stem, but obliquely to either side, and the robot still does the right thing. So not only did they cross the gap, they crossed the gap with a robust controller. It allowed the robot to do the right thing in different simulated conditions and also different simulated physical conditions. Okay, so again, a relatively simple experiment, but this basic approach is being used in simulators that are at the opposite end of the spectrum from two lookup tables, right? A generally good strategy. But as we mentioned, as we just mentioned, there are still problems because the robot is going to be robust to some aspects, but not to others. So this particular Evolve controller did well in these three different environments, with these three different conditions. But what about a fourth condition where the ground is bumpy, right? Or the overall ambient light is high. You'll notice here that this was done in complete, almost complete darkness. How do we know, right? We're probably not going to get perfectly lucky. In this case, they transferred just one controller. Wouldn't it be great if we could create a pipeline where we're continuously evolving controllers or robots in simulation and continuously sending them to reality? The first one we send may be robust to three conditions, but not conditions four through 10. We throw that robot away, take the next from, from simulation, try it out. Maybe it's robust to only one of the 10 conditions. Throw it away, take a third one. That one is robust to eight out of the 10 conditions. We're getting closer. So you could imagine now an algorithm where we have an inner loop, which is the evolutionary algorithm evolving robots in simulation, and an outer loop that is periodically trying to cross the gap and observing how well robots do at crossing the gap. If we want to tackle that problem, we're going to have to automate the way that we cross the gap. We're going to have to make it easier and faster to send more and more robots from simulation to reality. And that was a, that was a task that was tackled in the Golem project. So. <clears throat> Okay, Golem Project, as you can see from the date here, was published almost 20 years ago. It is, I think, one, maybe not the only, but one of very few robotics experiments that actually made it to the front page of the New York Times. Uh, I showed you our Xenobots in the first day of class. Uh, we heard from the New York Times there's an article coming on the Xenobots, so we hope they publish it before August, and maybe we can make it to the front page of the New York Times again in less than 20 years after the last time an evolutionary robotics experiment made it to the New York Times. Okay. Why was this so exciting, not just to the investigators of this project, Lipson and Pollock, but to the general public? To the general public, this was obviously not an evolutionary robotics experiment because no one knew what evolutionary robotics was. According at least to the New York Times, this was the first robot that made robots. What are they talking about? What was happening in two, around 2000 in terms of technology? This, is, this project, from our, for our purposes, is going to be about the sim to real gap, but there was something else here that was even more exciting to the general public. Personal computers. Personal computers. That was already sort of late 80s, early 90s. Everyone was comfortable with PCs at this point. 3D printing. 3D printing. So 
This was not really about robots. It was about robots making robots. This idea of this machine, which the public learned around this time, was called a 3D printer. And in this case, part of the, the thing about this project that made it so exciting is that for many people, the 3D printer is a robot, right? It has moving parts. It has an arm, and it moves about and does things. It was a robot that was making robots, which is an idea that's been around in science fiction forever. Um, this is actually uh, a cartoon from an 80s NASA conference um, where this was an idea, or still is an idea, that's particularly interesting to NASA for an obvious reason. If we want to do large-scale colonization of uh, moons and planets in the solar system, it would be very costly to send 10,000 robots in a rocket to Mars. But perhaps we could send just one 3D printer and get the printer onto the surface, and as long as there was enough raw materials close enough to the 3D printer that it could draw into itself, the 3D printer could print a robot which would collect more materials and build a 3D printer, and that 3D printer would print three robots, and those three robots would build seven 3D printers, and so on and so forth, right? That's the vision, remains a vision. It's an idea that actually goes back to the late 40s. For all the computer scientists here, you should be familiar with the von Neumann architecture, which is the way that computer chips are made. Von Neumann is famous for many things. One of them is the von Neumann architecture. The other one is von Neumann machines. So back in the late 40s, he laid out the theory of what is the, uh, what is the least complex machine that can build a copy of itself. Okay, so a lot of other aspects of the Golem project that were exciting. We're going to focus mostly on the evolution and robotics side of this as it relates to crossing the gap. Okay, another aspect of this which we've seen once before now is we're going to, or the investigators expanded the evolutionary algorithm so that it's not just evolving the controller of the robot, it is evolving the body of the robot as well. As you saw in the picture, the, this robot is made up of a bunch of bars and linkages. So the bars are represented by the bars here, and the balls here are the linkages. Um, for our purposes, you can think of these, for the moment, these balls as like ball and socket joints in your shoulder or your hip. Step one of the experiment, they're going to evolve both body and brain in simulation. So uh, back in the year 2000, there were the very first physics engines. So they did use a physics engine in this case. They're going to then take the evolved designs and send them to a 3D printer. And the 3D printer uh, prints the plastic parts of the robot. But at that time, there were no 3D printers that could print cer ceramics or metals or electronics. So they're going to have to snap in to this plastic uh, sculpture, the other necessary components of a robot. Step one, two, three. Okay. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the evolutionary algorithm to begin with. When we talked about evolutionary algorithms, we introduced this idea that there are many different kinds of evolutionary algorithms, and they encode the genotype or the genome in different ways. Most evolutionary algorithms encode the genotype as a vector or a matrix. In the Golem project, the genome is encoded as a list of lists. So the overall list, the robot list, is made up of four lists. The first one encodes the vertices of all of the linkages. The next, the second list, encodes information about all the bars connecting the linkages together. Third list, all the neurons. And finally, the fourth, all the actuators. So let's unpack each of these lists. The first list is itself a list of uh, triples, x, y, z coordinates that, as you can imagine, identify a set of points in space, which become the linkages. The next, uh, the next set of uh, lists are lists of quadruples. The first two numbers in a quadruple represent uh, IDs that point back into the list of vertices. So this quadruple will encode a particular bar that says, I start at this vertex and I go to this vertex, or I start at this linkage and I go to this linkage. And then there is a relaxed length and stiffness. What does that mean? What does that remind you of? Uh, 
Where have we seen stiffness before in this chorus? It's a spring. So in the, in the cartoon here, these look like metal rods or plastic rods, which they are. Some of them, however, are going to be cut in half, and we're going to put a spring in the middle so that the length of the bar can lengthen and shorten. This also should start to sound familiar. There was another robot we saw that was made up of a bunch of rods and springs. What was it? Does anybody remember? That's right. So Nick Cheney's Tensegrity robot that we saw in the very first class was uh, inspired by the, the Golem robots here. So this is not quite a Tensegrity robot, but, but close. Okay, so uh, a relaxed length, what does that mean? It means the default length that that bar likes to be at, but we're going to add actuators that are going to push and pull on some of these bars, and the bars are going to be pulled and pushed away from their relaxed length, and the distance at which they will tolerate being pulled or pushed away from their, re their relaxed length is dictated by their evolved stiffness. So we can have stiffer or softer springs in our golem machines. The third list is a list of, uh, I don't know how many numbers here, um, however many elements there are in the neurons list, that's how many neurons there are, and each neuron has a threshold, which is evolved. Every, every parameter here is under evolutionary control. So as we just saw in the previous experiment, every neuron is going to have a step function, activation function, but the point at which it switches from a negative to a positive number, all of those neurons have different thresholds at which they do so. There is also a whole bunch of numbers that uh, for each neuron that dictate uh, its synapse coefficient or its weight. So you'll notice that there is no list here for synapses. The idea is going to be that uh, whenever we add a neuron to the genotype, we also wire that neuron up to every other neuron in the neural network. So it's kind of an indirect way of encoding the synapses. Details don't matter too much for our purposes today. So you can imagine that with the first two lists of vertices and bars, we are specifying the body of a robot. The third list creates a set of neurons and synapses, but we now have a disconnected body and brain. We need to connect them together. So the fourth and final list is a list of triples. Each element in the list corresponds to an actuator. An actuator specifies a particular bar and a particular neuron and connects them together, which transforms that neuron into a motor neuron, right? So the value at that neuron is then being sent to the bar. And the third parameter of that actuator or that motor is bar range. What is the motor here? Doesn't actually say, but from all these hints, what are, what are the motors and how are they acting on the robot's body? How far can move? Move in what way? You'll notice here that we are not connecting bars to vertices or linkages. We're connecting motors to the bars themselves. It's another hint about the kind of actuators that are being used here. It's that the springs are important, right? We're connecting the motor to the spring. So this is a linear actuator. It's a piston. It's something that is grabbing onto the spring and pulling and pushing on the spring, right? We saw this before when we saw the hybrid dynamic walker that was walking and had springs and there were the motors were pulling and pushing on the, the springs, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, depending on how many actuators we have, we can have one or more neurons that are sending values to one or more motors. Okay, so that's how, that's how the bodies and brains are encoded. So you can imagine now evolution making changes to elements in this, making changes in this list of lists, which are the mutation operators. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's talk about the evolutionary algorithm first. In the experiments reported in the paper, they started with an initial population of not random genotypes, but null genotypes. So they had a null list of four null lists. Seems like kind of an odd choice. Uh, 
Fitness function, very familiar. We've seen this before, the displacement of the center of mass. They evaluated each robot, not for 500 time steps in the simulator, but for 12 cycles of its neural control. Again, kind of cryptic, but it should give you a hint about some other element of the neural network that's in here that we haven't mentioned yet. What does 12 cycles mean? Something's repeating 12 times. What else must be in this neural network aside from what we've described so far? What aspects of a neural system tends to just spontaneously repeat or cycle? The CPGs, right? So there's a, a central pacemaker here that is dictating a sinusoidal pattern, and they allow that sinusoidal pattern to repeat 12 times. That sinusoidal pattern enters the neural network, and depending on the neurons and the synaptic connectivity, it produces some complex motion in the robot's body. Okay. One of, the most, one of the more interesting aspects of this are the mutation operators. A lot of what we've seen so far is a fixed architecture, right? We have 28 weights and we're tinkering, or evolution is tinkering with the weights, but we're not normally adding or removing material. We've seen a few exceptions so far. We saw the hyperneat algorithm, which was evolving CPPNs last week. Same thing here. This is also going to add and remove neural structure but it is also going to add and remove parts of the body, which we have not seen before. In this evolutionary algorithm, there are 10 different kinds of mutations that can be applied to any given genotype. So during the evolutionary process, if one particular gene robot survives, its genotype is copied. Some uh, point in the genome is identified at random. A 10-sided die is rolled, and depending on the, the value of that random number between 1 and 10, that mutation is applied to the genotype. Number one, we pick a random bar and change the default length of that bar. Number two, we grab a random synapse, change its weight. Number three, we grab a vertex and add a dangling bar to that vertex or we grab a random vertex and remove a dangling bar, and so on. You'll notice some of these mutations are applied uh, with greater frequency than others. In this paper, there is the following figure that shows a series of mutations that turn a, a null robot, so a, a null list of, of four null lists, which produces, obviously, nothing. Each black arrow here represents the application of one of these 10 mutations to turn it into something else. So I'm gonna give you five minutes to turn to your neighbor. See if you can label these six black arrows with one or maybe two. In some cases, there may be more than one mutation that's applied to turn, for example, this robot into this robot. See if you can figure out what they are and we'll reconvene in two or three minutes time to see what you came up with. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, not the easiest task. Some of these are easier than others. What mutation is going to turn the null genotype into this one short bar? Number three, right? Add a, a dangling bar. Again, some of this is a little ambiguous. It kind of assumes that there's a vertex to which you're adding the dangling bar. You could argue there are no vertices here, but it makes sense. How about this one? Change the length, right? That one's pretty straightforward. How about this one? Oh, sorry, this transition. Add what? Add the neuron, right, which is wherever that is there. Number five, add an unconnected neuron and also change the length of the bar. So two mutation operators were applied here. How about at this arrow, at this transition? What mutations changed this genotype into this genotype? So we're, so we're increasing the length. So number one, we're adding a neuron, uh, number five, again. And you'll notice that a synapse has been implicitly created. Every time a mutation adds a neuron to the neural network, it also, it also connects that new neuron to every other neuron that already exists in the, the neural network with at the initially random coefficients, right? And those can be changed later on. Okay, uh, this one is a little tricky. I think there's a typo here. There's this change in weight here. Uh, change in synaptic weight. It's assumed that there is a zero weight connecting this neuron back to this one, and it's now been changed to be an inhibitory connection. Again, this is kind of a cartoon figure Take it with a grain of salt. What about the body? What mutation changed this body into this body? Split bar into two and add a vertex. But there was one bar in the parent and three bars in the child. Yeah, it's a little hard to see here. There's one in the background, a second, and a third. Number seven, so split the vertex into two. They're taking this vertex here, they're splitting it into two vertices, and although it doesn't say it here, move them slightly apart and connect them with a new bar, which is this one. So we're taking one bar, splitting the top vertex into two and connecting with a small bar. Again, it doesn't matter too much, but you get the idea, which is an important idea here, which underlies most of evolutionary robotics. The spirit of evolutionary robotics is start simple. In this case, start as simple as possible. And over evolutionary time, evolution can mutate and tinker and complexify both the bodies and neural controllers of the robots as it goes. Rather than starting with an initially complex robot designed by a human, Thinking about thinking is misleading. Let evolution figure out how to start simple and gradually build up an increasingly complex robot. Right? The details of the mutation operators here aren't important. What's important is to see how they went about trying to evolve simple robots into more complex robots. Here are my guesses. Uh, they may be right or wrong. Doesn't, doesn't really matter for our purposes. Okay, so let's get to the fun part. What did they actually evolve? 
Uh, again, this paper is 20 years old, so I apologize for the resolution here. Um, they had some nice visuals in this paper, though, that sort of give you, gave you a good idea about what was actually happening during the evolutionary process. What you're looking at here is a, a set of samples from one evolutionary uh, generation. So this is a snapshot at a particular point in evolutionary time. You'll notice that obviously there are differences in the body plans, but also a lot of similarities. You'll notice a lot of tetrahedral shapes. Why? Stability is important, right? So given this sort of universe of possible body plans, tetrahedral shapes are pretty stable. The nature of the mutations also tend to favor the creation of tetrahedral shapes. If you take a bar and you split it into two bars and attach the two bars with a third, you've got a triangle. If you do it again, you have two connected triangles. So there is, first of all, a selective pressure there's probably something in evolution that's favoring tetrahedrons because they're stable, but there's also a bias in the way that mutations happen. So this is an important thing to remember about artificial evolution and also biological evolution, which is that mutations are random. They can hit at any point in the genotype, but their phenotypic repercussions, the effect they have on body and brain is non-random. If you have offspring that, that incur mutations during development, you would hope that those mutations don't randomly rearrange phenotypes of your offspring. You would hope that the effects are non-random. They increase the height uh, of the child, but not the height of one leg and not the other, right? There are very important biases that exist. We want to have an evolutionary system in which Genotypic changes are random, but phenotypic repercussions are non-random, which introduces biases. We also saw this last week when we talked about CPPNs. CPPNs were designed explicitly to bias away from random patterns and towards gradients and repetition and gradients of gradients and repetitions within repetitions and so on. Okay. Here's an example now. This is a cut not across the population at one point in time, but across time. So it's showing the best individuals in the population at generation four, then generation 60, 82, and all the way up to generation uh, 198. Uh, with very, some of the individuals at that point in time more or less fit. You'll notice that there is definitely a lineage here. These are all genetically related. Some of them don't move at all. They have an F of zero. Some of them move a little bit and so on. Here is yet another visualization that might come in handy uh, when you get to your final project. And maybe we'll finish with this today. This is a way not of visualizing how, how a robot moves, but how evolution moves over time. Each of these four panels is showing four separate evolutionary runs. And usually we plot evolutionary time going from left to right. In this case, we're plotting evolutionary time going from top to bottom. And we're gonna use the horizontal axis for what, what's called ancestral proximity here. So if we have one parent and two children, then if, since time is increasing as we go down, then the parent is higher than the children, but the children have a common ancestor, which is the ancestor from the previous generation. They have a common parent. So those two children are close to one another horizontally. If those children in turn have their own children, then among those grandchildren, two of those grandchildren may be further apart horizontally because their common ancestor is two generations back. They have a common grandparent but different parents. So if we take a horizontal slice through this plot, we can see in this run, there is a sprinkling of points that are very far. Some of them, some of these points in this cut are close to one another, uh, uh, siblings and cousins and second cousins and so on. And then there are others that are very far from one another where their common ancestor, they have to go all the way back to the initial null population to find a common ancestor. And you can see that when you plot evolutionary progression in this way, you get these different kinds of trees where the shape of the tree or the shape of the phylogeny tells you something about the evolutionary dynamics that 
occurred during that evolutionary process. In this case, at the end, as you can probably imagine, they ended up with robots that have very different bodies and brains because they're all dissimilar from one another. They have evolved away from a very early common ancestor. They reran the tape. They went back and did another evolutionary run and got a completely different result. At the end here, they ended up with 95% of the robots all looked very similar because they were siblings or cousins. And there was a small grouping of third or fourth cousins. But they were all sort of related. You can see that there was this very successful lineage that sort of dominated the population. In this third case, there were two distinct groups of robots where within each group, they had recent common ancestors. And between the two groups, they had very old common ancestors. So they called this here in the paper emergence of species. It's not quite species because you could probably genetically recombine the material from these robots. And in the fourth run here, you had these fantastic dinosaur robots that were all there was in the population early on. However, there was one or two robots that had slightly different uh, body plans and did slightly different things. Those did not do very well for a while, but there were always a couple of them in the population. There were always three of them in the population for a while. And then eventually a mutation hit this group of three and they started to do much better than this group and eventually grow, drove this group to extinction. Yeah. Okay, a good plot to remember, relatively easy to create and it gives you a, a, re a really easy overview of what's happening in your evolving population. You have a quiz due tonight. Some of you are working on assignment eight. Some of you are working on weekly report three. Have a good spring recess. I will not be here the week after spring recess. There will be a guest lecturer. I will see you in about two weeks time.